Paul Grieve and his in-laws decided to raise 50 chickens on their quarter-acre backyard. When those sold quickly, he bought more and eventually became the largest pastured poultry producer in the country. There was nobody scaled up enough within True Pasture Raised to be a really solid, strong partner to a bunch of e-commerce business and get it delivered to you at a decent cost that you can go and put your margin on and still make money. I mean, that was a big part of what we were trying to build. To scale Pasture Bird, they built their own automated range coop to autonomously move 6,000 birds to new pasture every day using solar energy. This growth and innovation caught the attention of one of the largest animal protein companies in the country, Purdue Farms, who acquired Pasture Bird in 2019. It's not that small scale is not important, it's just helping these big ag companies do something differently is also a really noble task. They have all kinds of efficiencies and resources that I don't care what we do, we'll never have. So when we had the chance to like start talking to Purdue and helping them build a real, authentic, genuine pasture raised program, it was like, this is a good thing too. Jeanette Barnard returns to co-host today's episode with Paul Grieve, which is an incredible story of entrepreneurship, technology, regenerative farming, and a glimpse into the future of agriculture. Well, hello, fellow ag nerds. Thanks so much for joining me for another episode of the Future of Agriculture podcast. My name is Tim Hamrich, and every week I get to sit down with the founders, the farmers, the innovators, the investors, the people shaping the future of the ag industry. And what a great show we have for you here today. I'm so excited, first of all, to welcome back Jeanette Barnard to co-host today's episode. Jeanette is a part of the Merck Animal Health Ventures team, where she invests in animal-related startups, and she's the creator of Prime Future, a weekly newsletter highlighting trends in the animal protein value chain, which I'm sure you have subscribed to, but if you don't, you need to do that. It's free and it's tremendous. You can do it at primefuture.substack.com. Many of you will remember the very popular episodes that Jeanette has co-hosted in the past on this show, which I will go ahead and link to in the show notes if you haven't caught them all. And you might also remember her presence on our Ag Tech Venture Capital Roundtable that happened this past December. Anyway, as you could tell, I'm super excited to have her back co-hosting today's episode. Thank you so much and welcome Jeanette Barnard. Thanks so much for having me, Tim. Great to be here. Well, as you know, you're my go-to person when it comes to innovation in animal agriculture, and I know you play that role for a lot of other people through your newsletter and all the work that you do, which I think is great because these are massive industries that really have a lot of opportunities that may get overlooked for potential future innovation, right? That's right. And, you know, I started writing Prime Future in 2020, and one of my core theses was Look, there's all of this capital going into alternative protein, which is fine and well and is it has its place, but there's also so many opportunities for innovation and so many pockets of innovation that are happening within animal agriculture that I'm bullish on animal protein, right? I just think there's a lot happening in the industry that's really compelling and as you think about okay, on the crop side, of ag tech, you know, that's kind of had its moment in the sun, if you will, that was kicked off with the acquisition of Climate Corp by Monsanto in 2013. The livestock side is really just getting going. It's really in the early stages. And I'm going to say even in the last two years, there's been a pretty significant uptick in the number of companies coming into this space, the amount of venture capital coming into this space. There's just a lot of momentum building around animal ag tech. Well, you already have shared multiple examples of that on previous episodes of the show. And I know you've got another great example of that for us here today. So why don't you go ahead and introduce us to who we have on today's show and why you wanted to bring their story in particular to the FOA audience. So Paul Grieve is the founder of Pasture Bird, and I have followed him on social media for a little while, just seeing some of the really interesting and I'm not going to say contrarian takes that he puts out there, but the counterintuitive takes that he puts out there on social media. And on social media, I'm going to say especially Twitter, there's kind of this sense that there's this pocket of regenerative ag that is, there are the purists, and then there's the rest of production agriculture. And it's, it's often positioned as the two are at odds with one another. And what I saw from Paul is he's saying, no, no, we have to be practical and think about food production at scale. And let's think about what are ways that we can incorporate more regenerative practices. So that was what got me interested in him. And as I learned more about the pasture bird business, 
it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, he started with 50 chickens in his backyard that they were raising as a pasture raised chicken and selling those. He saw quickly how much demand there was for that, but realized in order to scale pasture raised poultry production, you have this massive labor issue of the time and effort it takes to move birds around the pasture. And so then he developed and designed this piece of technology that is a movable poultry house. So the birds are always on fresh grass, which is really interesting. And so what intrigued me about his business is he's sitting here with this direct-to-consumer model where he's selling chicken directly to consumers and there's a technology component to his business. And so that's a pretty unique situation. Yeah, Paul is just so impressive. I mean, a former college athlete, Marine Corps officer, and certified public accountant turned farmer. Growing up in Seattle, he was not from an ag background at all and built this successful company, raising hundreds of thousands of birds on pasture, selling to the top chefs and restaurants throughout Southern California, and even sports teams, he said, like the Lakers and the Dodgers. So much to dig into here. So without further ado, here is Jeanette's interview with Paul Grieve of Pasture Bird. Pasture Bird's the largest pasture-raised chicken company in the U.S., it's crazy to even say that because of kind of how we started out with just 50 chickens in our backyard and no real ag experience at all. But our whole thing is around moving animals to fresh pasture every day. So we've developed some really cool, unique coop technology that's autonomous and solar powered. And it's pretty exciting. We really think it has the potential to like kind of help shape the future of agriculture. So it's exciting to be talking to you guys today. So when you started with 50 birds in your backyard, how did you get from there to the point of having this, you know, patented chicken housing technology? That that seems like a really big jump. What was that process like? Oh, I mean, have you ever pulled a chicken tractor by hand before? Like you start thinking, how do I stop having to do this all the time pretty quick? But we just started as a hobby. My story was I had Lyme disease from sniper school in the Marine Corps and um, started feeling pretty crappy, eating better, feeling better, you know exercise, local food, organic, kind of got into the whole thing. And when I came back from Iraq, we were joking about just getting some chickens for the backyard because we were like, man, this free range stuff, it's not really what it's cracked up to be. Neither is organic. You know, they're all raised like in a big barn with varying degrees of, you know, you could call it outdoor access, but realistically, like the birds really aren't going out that much. So we got excited about this idea of like pasture raised chicken and eggs and we just thought we were going to raise 50 birds for my family, which is pretty big. So we got the birds, kind of raised them, you know, processed them in the backyard, that whole thing. And to our surprise, like all 50 birds sold out before we even had harvested them. So my family was kind of upset that like I had pre-sold all the chickens. And so the next month we had to do 100 and then 200 and then 500 and then 1,000. And pretty soon we started thinking about ways that this could and should scale because when you see the impact of it and you see soil health getting built and really healthy, happy, tasty animals kind of being raised, it feels like we're onto something here, you know. And we're part of a um, American Pasture Poultry Producers Association, which is about a thousand of us pastured poultry producers doing things this way. And so there was a lot of just growth and encouragement in the space as a whole. So we've always just considered ourselves one of many pastured poultry farmers. We happen to be the biggest, you know, but not necessarily the best by any means. So as a pasture poultry producer, that's a mouthful there. Um, It's a mouthful. (laughs) I know it needs a rebrand, but it is what it is. Yeah, I'm I'm just going to say it slowly to try not to stumble over it. But as you think about that, is the biggest barrier to scale, is it access to land or is it really the labor because it's so intensive to manage the birds in the system? It all depends where you are. So geographically, you know, climate can be a huge issue. So if you go up north, like you're not doing pasture poultry in the winter. A lot of places have big time restrictive access to processing. If you want to sell to anybody more than like your local neighbor's whole bird farm, farmer's market, you have to be in a USDA plant. And that's a lot to put up yourself. It's lucky if you kind of have access. Chicken's not like cattle. You can't drive them you know, 12 hours to processing. So you have to be within a couple hours really of USDA processing that's going to let you in. So 
we wanted to raise cattle. I mean, grass fed beef is like what we were all most interested in, but we're in Southern California, right? So you take a step back and you're kind of like, what can I do a good job at? Where's there like a market gap where we could do something that nobody else is really doing? And we have, you know, 350 days of sunshine here in SoCal. Land is super, super expensive. So it lends itself to something where you can make more dollars per acre. And we happen to have like a USDA processing option pretty close to us that was going to let us in. So capital, like talking about capital, beef is way more expensive to get into than small scale chicken. You know, a broiler from chick to harvest can be seven, eight weeks. And with beef cattle, you're talking about breeding and then calving and finishing. And I mean, you're like way out on beef cattle. So it was essentially like we could put a bunch of money on a credit card, buy chicks and feed. And by the time the payment was like really, really due, we were kind of like getting paid. And it it worked like that for a little while. I love that. I mean, that's just such a great example of starting small where you can and kind of making that operating capital cycle work for you uh, with the life cycle of the animal. So I I love that example. So, okay, before we go further, though, describe for folks who haven't followed you on Twitter or LinkedIn, which they're totally missing out if they haven't, but describe for them when you talk about your autonomous solar powered chicken coop technology, what is it and what does it do and what's unique about it? Yeah, so to understand what we do, you have to understand what everybody else does. And I'll talk a lot about what other people do. And it's never meant as like a knock. We have nothing but respect for everybody trying to grow food. You know, I'll say things that sometimes come off as me trying to say we're better or smarter. It's not that at all. We think there's an opportunity to do something different for sure. But that doesn't mean what they're doing is not good or they're bad people or something like that. So the way poultry is raised, you know, 99.999% of the 9 billion broilers raised in the U.S. a year are in stationary housing. So typically you'll have something like a, you know, 600 foot by 50 foot wide kind of barn structure, 25,000 ish birds inside of each barn. That kind of represents your like conventional poultry production. You can imagine, you know, even without having any background in egg, you can imagine kind of what that looks like and smells like. I mean, one of the big things is the animals are pooping in the same place that they're sleeping and living and eating. So again, it's not a knock, but it is what it is. Then you take kind of like a free range system, which to the untrained eye would mean like, oh yeah, these birds are just out running around in an open field. No, that's not at all what it is. You know, a free range system is you take that same stationary house, you put some doors along the sides of it, and you give the birds access to the outdoors. Now, it doesn't ever matter if the birds actually go outside or not. It's the fact that they had access to go outdoors that makes it free range. It's better than not being free range, you know, by a couple percent maybe, but it's really similar. The birds are prey animals, so they're going to spend most of their time close to their food, water, shade, and their buddies. Uh, if you've ever been to like Hawaii or Thailand, you know, they're, they're, they're flock animals, they're prey animals, they're kind of hiding out, they want to be in the shade. They don't want to go too far away from their food and water. So for the most part, depending on the breed, 96 to 99% of their life is spent inside of the barn. Now you take like organic production, you know, again, conjures up different things in different people's heads, but that's essentially like a free range barn with USDA certified organic feed and you know, restrictions on like antibiotic use and stuff like that. So it all looks really similar. If you or I was to walk into an organic barn versus a free range versus a conventional across, you know, thousands and thousands of farms in the U.S. It all feels really, really similar. So where we thought the innovation was, and again, it's not like we came up with this idea. Nature came up with it first. Joel Salatin kind of like pioneered it in the U.S. But it's this idea of like mobile coops that have no floor on them. So think of, you know, a greenhouse that's on skids where the birds are actually living on that fresh pasture material. So Instead of like wood chips or, you know, rice holes for their bedding, they're actually living on your pasture or your cover crop. And then every 24 hours, we're moving that whole barn to a fresh spot. So the birds have fresh forages, you know, feed bugs and worms and grasses and seeds. And they have a fresh spot to kind of lay their head down and it's clean. It smells really good. It looks good. And it does a lot for the chicken, too. It's awesome in every way, really, except it's just super time consuming and labor intensive. So our big thought was in order to scale pastured poultry, we need to start to take the labor out of it and get it 
kind of to um, some of the standard efficiencies that you see in the industrial system. So how do we get better pricing on chicks and feed and, you know, logistics and harvest? How do we take some of the labor out of moving these birds and feeding them every day? So our big invention, which is an automated range coop, is a solar powered 6,000 bird structure. It's 150 feet by 50 wide, so 7,500 square feet. And um, it has a bunch of independent drive motors that actually drive the system to fresh pasture each day. We're trying to take the best from conventional ag and kind of combine it from the best with small scale local farmers markets that are doing pasture poultry. And our whole mission as a company is making nutrient dense and pasture raised chicken more accessible and more affordable. Okay, perfect. So this makes a lot of sense. Having spent a lot of time in the commercial poultry industry and understanding the drive towards efficiency, what I hear you saying is, look, we need efficiencies in order to produce protein in a cost effective way. But we're also trying to incorporate this element of what some might call regenerative agriculture. So this is one thing that has intrigued me about your interactions on Twitter is sometimes in this regenerative space, it seems like there's the purists who are pro regenerative and small scale production. And so what you're talking about is a little bit more of a pragmatic approach. So maybe let's start there of how you think about that of kind of that purist approach to regenerative agriculture, small scale production versus the pragmatic perspective of needing to scale, needing to get to those better efficiencies, better cost. Yeah, I mean, it's such a good topic. And I'm not saying I've got it all figured out. But my current line of thinking, we started in 2012, we started with a really small local direct to consumer, you know, mixed livestock business called Primal Pastures still exists today. I love the business probably have you know, a 1000 customers that we sell to my family owns and runs it still. I kind of got bummed out, though. So three years into that, we're doing okay, we're making money and um, we're growing the business. But I started to feel like we're just kind of selling food to rich people a little bit. And I love our customer. And don't get me wrong, but I grew up really like square in the middle class. And we're selling these chickens for $35, you know, $40. And that's kind of like what we had to do to be able to stay financially sustainable or regenerative or what do you want to say? It's fine. Like we were selling the product for what we needed to sell it for. But so many families, including my own when I was growing up, like could never afford to pay that kind of a price. And so it's not that I don't think small scale local regenerative ag is important. Like I think it is. But if we really want to change the world and like leave an impact, I would love for our kids to fall in on something that looks different maybe than how it looks right now, or at least a different trajectory with some other options on production. So it just came very clear to me and my brother-in-law and kind of like some other people in my family that It's not that small scale is not important. It's just helping these big ag companies do something differently is also a really noble task. It's a good thing to focus on. They have, you know, all kinds of efficiencies and resources that I don't care what we do, we'll never have. They've figured a lot of things out. I mean, look at just the feed pans that they have. There's so much technology that goes into just that one tiny piece of the equation alone. It's stupid for us to just think, It has to be one or the other. It's either small scale or it's huge industrial kind of, you know, factory farming, if you're open to that word, I guess, which to me, factory farming just means you're producing as cheap and efficient as possible. And that's kind of what people have asked for for a long time. The interesting thing to me is people are starting to ask for something different. And so I think you see these big ag companies wanting to produce what people are asking for. At the end of the day, you know, their businesses, like they want to produce a product that people want. So for 30, 40 years, people asked for cheap chicken, and they got cheap chicken, like Big Ag did a really, really, really good job of giving cheap chicken. Now I think people are coming in tune with this idea of like, it's not all about just cheap, like it does need to come at a good cost or a good price. But we're looking for other attributes, nutrient density, like what's it doing for the environment, the soil, animal welfare, like, We're thinking about more than just price now, which is good. And Big Ag wants to do things differently, you know. So when we had the chance to like start talking to Purdue and helping them build a real, authentic, genuine pasture raised program, it was like, no, no, this is a good thing too. That is awesome perspective. So 
you started down that path. Let's go there. Talk to us more about how did that Purdue Farms conversation start? What did it sound like? What got you guys excited about working with Purdue Farms? We had that company, Primal Pastures, within the family, and we saw this opportunity to bridge the gap between tiny you know, farmer's market to like these big free range guys. I mean, a small free range program, a you know, million birds a week, something like that out here in California. So it was like, why isn't there anything in between trying to fill a scaled up gap in the market for pasture raise? So we thought, okay, the way that we're going to do this is we're going to develop our cool coop technology, kind of kind of try to build something that we can give and help one of the big chicken companies to really do something authentic. We didn't even think ever about Purdue. We did not. I mean, we're West Coast guys, like born and bred. We always thought about some of the West Coast chicken companies out here as being our future partners. And we were really, really early in the process. We had just finished our prototype of the ARC when we got a call from an investor who had a connection with Ryan Purdue, who's like the fourth generation. I mean, he's actively involved in the day to day, but he lived in California and he was interested. He'd been doing a lot of research on pasture raised. He really had seen the writing on the wall with the regenerative kind of, I mean, regenerative is a crazy buzzword now, but what I really mean, like the genuine part of regenerative agriculture, and um, he thought that there was a big opportunity there. So he came out with some of the executive team back in 2018, just for like a meet and greet, you know, came out to the farm, showed them what we're up to, kind of like talked about pasture raise and what it is and what it's not. And that was kind of it, you know, and then like six months or so went by and we just kind of kept in touch and they remained interested. So they ended up investing in our business in late 2018. We were doing like a bridge round of financing, if you know people know what that is. And so then they were officially sort of part of the team, but no like controlling interest or voting or anything like that. And then in 2019, it just became clear that there were so many synergies, right? So like we use the same chicks as they do. We use the same feed. I mean, they're the largest organic chicken producer in the country, you know, so they have such awesome, scaled up, efficient access to chicks and feed and logistics, transportation. They own harvest plants. Like it was so obvious the synergies between the two. We ended up doing a full acquisition deal with them at the very end of 2019. And we've just been developing the process with them. And that's been so cool. You know, we're not hardcore chicken people. Like we're some dudes that figured out how to move a lot of animals, starting in our backyard and moving on to a, a few hundred acres. I mean, they have the real deal chicken people there. And so being able to bounce ideas off of them and really like dig into this idea of moving animals to fresh pasture all the time with chicken experts that have been in the game for 30, 40 years. That's been really, really cool. And Purdue has consistently taken a leadership position within poultry. So their history is, you know, they were really the first ones to go no antibiotics ever at large scale. They were the first ones to go big organic. They acquired Nyman Ranch, which is an awesome pork company out of the Midwest. They acquired Panorama Beef, which is a really awesome grass-fed, grass-finished kind of pasture-raised beef company. So they were really leading the industry in this space already. So it, it made sense for them too. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, Purdue is, to me, they're such an interesting example of A, investing in brand building. <laughs> They've invested a lot in building their brand and I think have a lot to show for that. And B, as you say, just being at the forefront of what some of these specific consumer segments want and what they are likely to want next. So from the Purdue perspective, are they looking at this as, hey, here's technology primarily, or are they looking at it, here was a company with technology and here was a company already raising pastured poultry? Which of those kind of was more strategically important to them? Was it the technology or the existing production and customer base? I don't want to necessarily speak for them. You know, I'm a full-time employee of the company now, post-acquisition. I don't want to pretend like I know exactly what was going on in their head. But we intentionally built technology because whether I'm doing 5,000 birds a week or 50,000 birds a week, I mean, it doesn't really make that big of a difference to them. You know, they're doing so many more than what we could ever even kind of dream of doing. So for us, strategically and trying to get a good return for our investors and be able to actually, you know, fund our development and stuff like that. We've stayed focused on what's the like technology that's going to plug in awesome to the future partner that we don't even know who it is yet, but we're going to build this thing to really like fit like a puzzle piece inside of a big chicken company. 
Well, I love it. I mean, it just, you guys were so clear in, there's a specific problem we're trying to solve with this technology. And that was a a problem that can be applied at scale. And so to me, like that's such an interesting approach that you took and, and obviously has worked out very well. So another piece I'm interested in, in following down this path is as you think about direct to consumer selling chicken, right? So you did this through your family business originally, I noticed on on social media, it looked like you had sold through CrowdCow and now selling through Purdue Farms e-commerce site. As you think about those three different channels of your own platform, selling through a third-party platform, and then selling through a large company's e-commerce platform, what are the pros and cons there? Where do you see the future headed as it relates to how consumers want to buy meat? I mean, I think the writing's already on the wall. In the meat space, we're always slower to kind of like adopt what's actually happening, I think. But uh, omnichannel retail is, I mean, it's where everything's headed. So, you know, we want to be able to find our favorite brands and our favorite products wherever we go, whether that's in retail or if it's online shopping or if it's Instacart or, you know, really anywhere I go, I want to be able to find the brands that I'm looking for. Amazon, your own company website. I think the days of going crazy with exclusivity with, you know, said partners and stuff like that. I think those are probably coming to an end and you're going to see this idea of like omni-channel. So yeah, you can buy our stuff right now on passionbird.com, CrowdCow. You know, you can buy it on several e-commerce platforms. To be honest, it's something we were trying to build is there was nobody scaled up enough within True Pasture Raise to be a really solid, strong partner to a bunch of e-commerce business. So a big part of what we were building was like, how do we get to the point where I can sell you 10,000 pounds of, you know, retail packed, frozen, boneless, skinless chicken breast, pasture raised, and get it delivered to you at a decent cost that you can go and put your margin on and still make money. I mean, that was a big part of what we were trying to build. But I think it's this idea of omni-channel is going to be huge. And e-commerce, I think it represents something like 8% of all grocery right now. And it's going up to, I think, 18% they're predicting by 2025, you know. So that's like almost a, you know, two, two, three X, almost tripling. And I think it's going to continue on from there as logistics get smarter and better. And AI is going to help a lot in the space. You know, our kids are not going to buy food the same way we do. I could say that for sure. Or they'll have more options at least, right? Right. I mean, I think the describing it as the the omnichannel approach to me, that's the right one, right? It's you have to have presence in the in the retail meat case at the grocery store. You also have to have presence online and ideally in multiple places, as you say. I mean, I think that's definitely the future of where we're going to see this headed. So let's talk a little bit more about how you see regenerative agriculture. Like, how do you define that? I've seen online, you've used words like biomimicry. You've talked about the soil health today. You've talked about this idea of, of bringing plants and animals back together in farming systems. To you, what are the big principles that really define this whole genre of regenerative agriculture? I keep it really simple. You know, in the Marine Corps, we say kiss, keep it simple, stupid. It's probably not meant to be an all encompassing definition, but I said, did you leave the land better than you found it last year? That's regenerative agriculture to me. So if you go back 100 years, if you ask your grandparents, or your great grandparents, they would not call it regenerative agriculture. They would just call it good farming. I think it's sad. I mean, sometimes we're like, Oh yeah, it's pasture raised, biodynamic, you know, uh, biomimicry, regenerative blah, and like they would have just called it chicken a hundred years ago. So sometimes we put all these fancy buzzwords on it. I get it, but at the end of the day, I think are you making the land better or worse each year? And there's practices that come with that, and there's outcomes that come with that too. So regenerative practices are things like integrating cover crops and moving animals across grasslands and using their manure as fertilizer. Regenerative outcomes is like, I'm going to get in with a soil sample and I want to see organic matter increasing. I want to see like fertility increasing. I want to see carbon being captured. I want to see, you know, water holding capacity increasing all the time. So there's also a difference between regenerative practices and regenerative outcomes, but it's very much like a buzzword right now. I see people slapping it on anything. If I was back in startup world, I would just say like regenerative anything. And I feel like you could get like $5 million in a seed round. It's just, it's a very hot word and it's going to go away because it's so hot. It's starting to not mean a whole lot, but I'm really excited about the idea of the plant animal integration. 
it's the past of food and I think it will be the future of food. It's this idea of like, yeah, plants feed animals. That's the way that we've been doing it for a long time. You know, it's either grass land for cattle or it's corn and soybeans really for chicken and pigs and, and really a lot of cattle are finished on corn and soybeans too. So plants have been feeding animals for a long time, but how do we now get animals to feed plants in a more efficient way? How do we reduce that like synthetic nitrogen fertilizer? How do we like really use animals as an asset instead of a liability? I think that's the stuff that we're super excited about. And it's hard to solve that in your backyard. Really like it's a problem that needs to be solved at scale. So I think that's what we're getting really excited about now. Wow, that is incredible framing both of regenerative practices versus regenerative outcomes. And then also this plant animal integration and plants have always fed animals. But now this question of how do we get animals to feed plants? I love that framing. And to your point about regenerative being a buzzword, we kind of do this in agriculture of a new word comes around, we throw it around a lot, it means nothing, then we need a new word. So yes, that's that seems to be a bad habit that we collectively have as an industry. Well, I actually draw a pretty hard line. I, I would actually say we're not regenerative all the way yet. And, and a lot of people would say there is no such thing as being perfectly, totally regenerative either. You know, some of the smartest sages in regenerative ag, old school guys would say like, there's no such thing as just arriving at regenerative. But in the chicken business, in any of the monogastric businesses, which is chickens and pigs, 50% of the impact is how you're raising the animals on the live side. The other 50 is how are the grains being grown? that you're feeding those animals. So like, we're trying to stay focused and figure out how to move a lot of animals across a cover crop or across, you know, a cornfield or put them in rotation with soybeans and all these cool things. But there's still a lot to figure out on the grain side too. And I'm of the mind that like, if we're going to make a huge impact, we need people to get focused in specific areas. And so there's great things happening on the regenerative grain production side not all of our grain is grown in a regenerative way. So I don't really like to go out and tout this huge thing that pasture bird is perfectly regenerative. I mean, we have some regenerative practices for sure. We have regenerative outcomes where we are raising our birds, but I, I would, I would not feel comfortable saying we're, you know, regenerative outcomes everywhere we grow our grain yet. And I like to be really just transparent and honest with people with stuff like that, because I don't know, I'm tired of like marketers treating people like they're stupid too. Hmm. Okay. So talk to us just about, at, and I guess just at a really high level and maybe comparatively speaking of the feed and the live performance metrics in a pasture raised system compared with a conventional system of both the cost of the feed, the cost of the gain, the time it takes, all of those things. I mean, can pasture raised poultry be sold at a middle-class price point? I guess that's maybe my ultimate question there. What's, what's your thought? I really do believe that it can. And we got the right partner for it now. I mean, I hope that we're not the only people that are going to try to do this because I think competition will be helpful ultimately. If it, if it's fair and not just grabbing a term like pasture raised regenerative and slapping it on a barn grown production, which is happening. You know, when you think about live production, we are a little bit slower. You know, the birds are moving every single day to new pasture. We're not nearly as thermal regulated as an industrial house is. The birds are picking up. It's really hard to say calorically, like I don't think the studies have really been done. I would guess 75% to 80% of their calories are still coming from the feed and 20 to 25% come from the pasture. However, it's not all about calories. It's also, you know, nutrition wise, when you sit inside of a coop and you watch the birds, they're foraging like 90% of the time, maybe hitting the the feed pan 10% of the time. And then What I think is the big next wave, kind of after regenerative, my prediction is you're going to hear a lot about nutrient density of food. And so when you study these animals that are raised on pasture like ours, and we put them into the labs, you see stuff like three times higher omega-3, 50% higher in the vitamin A and the vitamin E. You see like four times higher, eight times higher in a lot of micronutrients like um, NADH and ATP. So it really is like a more nutrient-dense bird. It takes a few extra days to raise them in our environment, like same breed versus same breed. Obviously, it takes way more land, kind of. I say more land, kind of, because we're raising the animals on more land, but they have to spread their manure somewhere, too. So really, they have to take up land to spread their manure out as well. So I I think it's somewhat apples to apples, to be honest, on the land, even though people don't realize that sometimes. But I think um, 
pasture raised likely will never be the cheapest way to do it as much as I wish, you know, I get jealous of like electric vehicles probably will become just overall cheaper to operate when they really reach scale and size. I don't know if that's going to be our story or not, but I think we can get extremely competitive with large scale industrial production. Historically, pasture race has been three, four times as expensive. I think if we can be within 20%, 10% of your kind of normal like baseline nothing against Walmart, but sort of Walmart chicken price. I think if we could be within 10, 20% of that, I think you'd see widespread adoption most likely. So we don't have to be the cheapest, cheapest, cheapest to have a big splash, but we do have to get it well away from 3X. You know, We need to be in that 20%, 30% higher kind of ballpark to really have the impact that I think is possible. So it's going to be interesting when the nutrient density conversation starts to really come into play, because in my opinion, you're just not going to get the mass market to care about how healthy my soil is. Like it's nice. You might get some people. It's kind of cool to think about healthy soil and all this stuff, but where the rubber really hits the road is like mom who wants to give baby the best food possible. Right. And so cool. Like your soil is healthy, but why should I care? Oh, you should care because healthy soil literally gives you healthier, more nutrient dense food. And here's the data behind it. And like being totally transparent with that data and publishing results and testing things. I think that's really going to be the next wave of food. And I think it'll be really exciting because you can't really be anything but outcomes based when it comes to nutrient density. And that's wild to think about how that going back to that interaction between the brand and the consumer. I mean, when you walk up to the meat case at the grocery store, you see a price per pound label, like that's what's there. And so this complete mind flip, that could bring a lot of changes with it. We'll see. I mean, it's, it's a, a lot of it comes back to like, how well can the stories be told? We've relied on attribute based marketing in the meat space for 30 years. You know, I don't know if customers are, I think they're getting pretty exhausted by all the different certifications and claims and labels and attributes and like, Meat packaging is starting to look like the side of a NASCAR truck where it's just, you don't even know what's what anymore. You know, I think that there's a big opening the market to tell real stories and um, go deeper with data and information and analytics and lab results than ever probably before. I think people actually want to know that. I've been encouraged by like, when I put stuff up on LinkedIn, almost like the deeper I go, the more people kind of react and respond to it. And I think that that's going to be a trend too, is we're going to start seeing brands get away from, you know, stickers and get back to stories. I think that that's going to be a trend. Man, that's it. That's a great soundbite. Um, I, I like to think though, that this, the, everything you just described, that it's going to force brands to get better at how they tell that story, right? Because having so much data, it's only valuable when you tell it in the right way. So to your point of telling a story, but telling it in bite size. I mean, pun intended, I suppose, but telling it in ways that, that consumers can latch onto, grab it, know what it means, it resonates, it, it hits the, the pain points or the concern points that they have. I think that there's an opportunity for brands within the meat and poultry industry to get a lot better at marketing than what we are today. Oh, 100% agreed. We relied on this like attribute, you know, it's uh, no antibiotics ever, you know, and that's like your whole brand, basically. Yeah, or it's a it's free range or it's organic that we've really relied on these like attribute based terms to define the whole space for a long time and you're starting to see you know farmer focus is like a brand that comes to mind shenandoah valley they're telling stories of farmers you know the product is still the birds are being grown really the same way essentially but people care people want to know who grew my food like that really does matter so i give them big time props for that farmer focus brand i feel like they're moving away from pure attribute based marketing into now let's start telling some stories. And I think that's a big part of why they've grown like a weed and they've been really successful with that brand. I would agree with that. Well, Paul, this has been a really fun discussion. You've given me a lot to think about, and I know that you've given the Future of Ag audience a lot to think about. So thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on. It's fun. Man, what a fantastic episode with Paul there, Jeanette. As always, really appreciate you bringing just these incredible stories of the innovation that's happening in animal ag. 
you know, for the audience, I'm trying to, and actually this will be the first official time I do this, but I'm trying to actually list some takeaways at the end that I'm taking away from the episode because I find it is not always the same as what others take away, which is great. But uh, for you, you know, what's a takeaway or two that you would have from this conversation with Paul? Yeah. So one takeaway for me is just this idea that regenerative agriculture does not have to be at odds with production at scale, right? And I think too often people think of those as just competing objectives and there are ways in which they don't have to be. So I appreciate just that holistic view that Paul has around these markets. Yeah, absolutely. I also thought it was interesting he touched on the nutrient density thing. You know, that's something that we had an episode specifically geared towards, I think back in November, I want to say. And it is an interesting and developing part of the future of agriculture. It's kind of like carbon in a way in that once we can measure it easily, accurately, reliably, then that starts to shift the goalposts on a lot of things. And he mentioned kind of the price of pastured poultry. But if you look at the price per nutrient, maybe it's not so expensive. And I think that is a super interesting part of the future bag. It's a pretty mind blowing thing to picture a future in which walking up to the meat case in the grocery store and instead of seeing a price per pound sticker on the package of poultry that you could see a price per nutrient sticker. That's a very different paradigm from what we're operating in now. Yeah. And I mean, I I could see the path to getting there. I know there's a lot of complications in like, okay, well, everyone can sort of choose their own nutrient, whatever makes them look the best. But I do think it's super interesting. And well, I appreciate you being on the show, hosting Paul and for your weekly writing, which I know is really creating a lot of interesting conversations in the industry. So where can people go if they are for some reason not yet a subscriber to Prime Future, but they love the episode today and they want more of this type of content? Thanks so much for the plug, Tim. Folks can go to primefuture.substack.com. And of course, if you want to know more about Paul and what they're doing at PastureBird, you can find out more at pasturebird.com. We'll link for all that in the show notes. Thanks so much for your time and your attention. I really don't take it lightly. I'll be back next week with another story of ag innovation. Innovation.